Hey, thank you for tuning in to City Church's On Demand Messages. My name is Josh, and I'm the pastor here. And we're so grateful that you are joining us from wherever you're coming from. In fact, we'd love to connect with you. If it's your first time, or, or maybe you're watching for a couple times, we would love for you to text guest to the number on the screen. We've got a free gift for you, and we would love to share a little bit more about who we are. Also, if you need prayer, if there's anything that we can pray for you about, even if as you're watching this message, something um, comes to your heart or mind that you need prayer for, we would love for you to text prayer to the number on the screen as well. And also, if you feel led to give this morning and be generous to the mission that God has called us to, to be for Jesus, for all people, and for our city, um, we would love for you to text give to the same number. We're currently in a series called Battleborn. We believe some of the greatest things in our life are born from some of the hardest and hard-fought battles that we face. And so this morning, uh, we're going to jump right into this week's message. And again, if we can do anything for you, please let us know. Enjoy the message. Okay. Um, is everybody excited to be here this morning? Yes, okay. Online, if you can give me a hand applause emoji thing right now, you know, that thing that's like this, that'd be awesome. Um, I'm excited about this morning. And, uh, and so we're going to start our second week of our series, Battle Born. And so this is the whole idea behind this series that I believe and we believe that some of the greatest breakthroughs are a result and can be born from some of the greatest battles that we face. And I, I don't think, I don't think there, there'll probably be anyone in this room or watching online that would disagree with that, that usually when we go through something that is difficult in our life, we hate it at the time, and it's really difficult at the time, but when we get on the other side of it, we realize that we're incredibly grateful for it. I was talking with um, one of our city builders, and city builders are volunteers here. Um, we believe that if you, if you serve with us, you're not filling a, a, a spot on a roster and not performing a task. You are helping us build a city, and so we call volunteers city builders. Um, we would love, if you want to be a city builder, a quick plug real fast, if you want to serve with us, we would love to have you. And so um, our city kids director is right over here raising her hands. If you want to serve in kids, please, that'd be amazing. We would love to have you serve with us. You can do that easily by just clicking, I want to be a city builder, on the Tuesday email that goes out. But I was talking to our city builder this morning, and she just asked, um, so just long story short, and I'll get to this in a second as well, I, I play basketball like all, growing up, like that's what I did. When I was six years old, I played soccer for one year, and that was awful, so I quit that. Fifth grade, I played baseball, hit a grand slam my first time up a bat, first swing ever, didn't get another uh, hit until the championship game. I quit that. I just played basketball. That was my lane, and so like my dream, as so many guys who play basketball, was to make it to the league, and um, I, someone was asking me this morning, like, hey, do you think you really would have made it there? And, um, and I was like, no, I was not as good as I thought I was. But that was the dream. But I had a series of, really not a series of injuries, of incredible, incredibly hard and difficult back injury that kind of took me out of playing basketball in college. And, um, and by the grace of God, like I was talking to them this morning, if, if that wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't have met my wife. If that wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't have been, I mean, God can do whatever, but I was headed on a completely different path than getting called into ministry, and ultimately, I don't know if I'd be here this morning. And so, it's an incredible gift, but it was an incredibly hard battle and fight. I think we'd all agree that we wouldn't wish the battles that we go through on anyone, but we're grateful for them. Some of the greatest breakthroughs in our life can be born from some of the greatest battles. And so, we are looking at one of the greatest battles of all time, the true underdog story in the Bible it's David versus Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. I'll just kind of catch you up to speed on what's going on because we're actually going to be somewhere else in the Bible this morning. But basically you have the Philistine army um, on one, there's this kind of, it says on one hill, the Philistine army, on the other hill, the Israel, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people on the other side. And, and in between there, the Israelites wanted to get to where the Philistines are and the Philistines wanted to get to where the Israelites are. And in between these two mountains, these hills was this valley. And in this valley stood a giant. A nine foot six giant with, with a javelin that weighed 15 pounds um, and a spear. Sorry, the spearhead weighed 15 pounds. His body armor weighed 125 pounds. I mean, this was a giant. We said, we looked at the story last week, and you have the Israelites that were standing on the ground that they were right then, the, the now ground. And we had this new ground that they wanted to take where they wanted to be, and in between there, in between them was a giant. And so many of us, we are in the now ground, but there's a new ground that God has for us. And usually in between the now ground and the new ground is some barrier, a giant. For a lot of us, we said last week that can be fear. 
Fear of loss, fear of failure, fear of the unknown. But fear can be crippling for us. And so fear, if that fear is the giant, what we learned last week is that God wants to turn our barriers into bridges into the new ground. What that, you know, the now ground and the new ground could be anything. It could be financially. Like now ground, I'm, I'm not healthy financially right now, and so I want to be to a place where I can be generous in the new ground. But in between that is a fear of what happens if I, if I stop spending money on the things that I want for myself. The now ground and the new ground could be, um, I, the now ground is I bought a gym membership. The new ground is I need to go to the gym. The fear is I don't know how to work any of the equipment. And there's always that dude in the gym that wears like the, the, the slim little tank tops and he's all swole, right? And I'm like, I don't want to stand by him. I don't need to try to get his weights off the bar so I can put my little weights on or whatever. I mean, the, the, the now ground is <sighs> my marriage is on the rocks. The new ground is, man, I want a healthy marriage that honors God. And in between the now ground and the new ground is this fear of well, what happens if I, if I come clean on the sin that I've been hiding for so long. The, the now ground is, man, I'm, I'm just an incredibly insecure person. This new ground is, man, God's given me this dream to do something. But I just, the, fear, the, the thing that stands in between is like, I just don't think I'm smart enough. I just don't think I'm talented enough. I just don't think I've got enough education to do what God's calling me to do. In all of our lives, there is a now ground and a new ground. So last week, if fear is the thing that's keeping you in between that, what the enemy wants us to believe is that we have to fight the giant of fear. But if we look at the story of David and Goliath, we see that you have these Israelites that are sh shuddering in fear, are terrified, are, are panicked are paralyzed by fear, and then David, the Savior, comes into the valley and defeats the giant. We said last week that we are not David in the story. As many of us want to be the heroes of our own story, I have a hero complex. I have a Savior complex. I want to fix and solve everyone's problems, and I want to be the one that does it, and I want you to know that I was the one that did it. That's not healthy me, but that's what I have inside of me. We all want to be the savior and the hero of the story. But when we look at the story of David and Goliath, we can never be the hero because we're not strong enough to defeat Goliath. We're not strong enough to defeat our giants. We need a savior to go on our behalf to defeat the giant. And so we said last week, the, the giant that you're fighting is not fear. It's self-reliance. It's you thinking that you're actually strong enough or good enough or me thinking that I'm strong enough to defeat the giant. And no, we need a Jesus to step in. And we learned last week that Jesus is the David for your giant. Jesus is the David. Jesus is the one that steps in on our behalf and gives us freedom. And where there are barriers in our life, Jesus wants to turn those into bridges. But he has to do that on his time and his power, not on our own. So today we're going to jump into a, another one. When I was in 10th grade, um, I, the summer between my 10th and 11th grade year, my dad thought it was a really good idea to put me through Olympic training and weight lifting workouts. So we had this place in, uh, in Savannah where I grew up, and it was a, an Olympic facility. And so literally guys that went to the Olympics worked out in this gym. And so there was this guy that ran the gym. His name was Rocky. Now, automatically, you're thinking that Rocky is like six foot seven just swole as can be, right? Like Rocky Balboa kind of thing. But Rocky was like, yay, tall. And Rocky was not fit whatsoever. But at one point he was. And at one point he went to the Olympics. And so he ran this entire gym. And so I remember walking up. So I've been this height since I was in seventh grade. Okay, I was this high. I was 6'5", size 14 shoe in seventh grade. I weighed about 90 pounds less than I do right now. Like the wind just kind of blew me over. But um, that was me. I looked like a blow pop, right? Big head, little body. Um, so... Uh, so, and it, so I, I got, I went into that workout and uh, a lot of guys from my team uh, that I played on went through that. And I remember Rocky sat with, sit down, sat down with us at the very beginning of the summer. He said, this is going to be the hardest summer that you've ever gone through. And he's, he's right. You, you, you're going to do two days. Um, on Fridays, you're going to actually wear your workout clothes and you're going to wear your workout shoes and then you're going to get in a pool and you're going to do the workout that you would do outside of the pool. You're going to do it in the pool. So you're going to run sprints in the pool with your shoes on. Sounds strange, I know. And then after that, you're going to get an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and you're going to swim 50 laps. Then after that, you're going to go home, and you're going to rest for a little while. Then you're going to come back, and we're going to do, like, weightlifting workouts. And you're probably, you know, it's Savannah in the middle of the summer. It's 100 degrees, and you're going to go run those bleachers in the middle of the afternoon. Rocky looked at me, and he said, 
This summer will not be easy. But on the, I said, really? This summer will not be easy, but on the other side of it, you'll be grateful you did it. So I'm just going to be completely honest, because if, if we're not honest, we're nothing here, okay? This morning is going to be incredibly difficult. It's not going to be easy. But I believe, not because of what I'm going to say or whatever power I have, but because of the power of Jesus, I believe that on the other side of this morning is the potential to be one of the greatest moments and experiences of your life. Because this morning we're not talking about the giant of fear. We're talking about the giant of resentment. You see, it's easy for us to be like, I'm brave, I don't have any fear. But what, what, what about when you're on the now ground and there's a new ground that God has for you and the giant in the middle is a dad who never said he loved you or he was proud of you? What do you do when the giant is a mom who was verbally abusive to you? What do you do when, when it was a husband who demeans you? What do you do when it was a friend who betrayed you? What do you do when the giant is a spouse who cheated on you? What do you do then? What do you do when those things have built up for so long and you've held on to them for so long and so now the giant, he's not nine foot six anymore, he's about 15 foot tall. And this giant of resentment is keeping you and holding you back from what God has called you to. See, so many of us, the now ground are wounds. They're not even scars, they're wounds. And on this new ground, there's freedom. But we can't even see a glimpse of freedom because the giant of resentment of what was done to you is so huge. You see, we love the story of David and Goliath, but if we backtrack about 14 chapters, we see this isn't the first time that the Israelites and the Philistines met. In fact, they met one time and the Philistines defeated the Israelites. And so the Israelites said, okay, you know what, this time we're going to take the Ark of the Covenant. So back in that, uh, back in that time, the Ark of the Covenant was the, the embodiment, the presence of the living God. So we're going to take the Ark of the Covenant with us, and then we're going to defeat these Philistines. And the Philistines defeated them again. They killed 30,000 men, and they stole the Ark of the Covenant. So it's funny that we look at David and Goliath, and we think that this is the first time the Israelites have faced off. But when we see this giant, we realize that this giant comes with a history that there's more to the story of this giant than meets the eye. And for so many of us in, in this room, being stopped and paralyzed with a giant of resentment, we have to be honest and say there's more than meets the eye. There's a history here. So here's what we're going to do this morning. I, I actually, I wanna, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, so you can turn there. If you're online, you can turn there as well. Um, if not, it'll be on the screen. It's fine. We're going to look at about seven verses. And what I want to do is I want to kind of show us how we get to facing this giant of resentment. We've got to start somewhere. So let's go ahead and uh, jump in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. It says, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. For many of us, this, this makes no sense, right? First thing, that if you're like me, I grew up in it and I believed and I was told that Christians don't get angry. But the problem is that, that Paul actually says that, Paul says, be angry. This isn't a suggestion. This is actually a command. Paul's saying, be angry. Very often, as followers of Jesus, it is our duty to be angry. Wait, well, Christians don't get angry. No, Paul's saying, be angry. And some of you guys are like, let's close the book now. I'm good. Like, you're looking at your spouse and being like, I told you my temper's for real. God loves my temper, so I'm good to go, okay? Like, some of you are like, I'm... Yeah, like, this is what I've been longing to hear for my entire life. Some of you tune back into church, or you're in church for the first time in a really long time, and you're like, man, this is the kind of church for me. I can get angry. I can get ticked off at everything. Here we go. Paul does say, be angry. Anger is the energy to defend something good or attack something that is wicked. See, it is put into us by God as being a part of his image bearers. And we have to understand that God is angry. He's angry at sin. He's angry at injustice. And so, actually, to be angry is to be more like God. Some of you are completely tripping out because I know I was as I was studying this. You see, anger is your ability to be awakened to injustice. So sometimes anger is required. Honestly, sometimes if you're not angry, you're wrong. Human trafficking should make you angry. Racism should make you angry. 
it should do something inside of us when we see an injustice happening. Uh, Martin Luther King had a series of principles of nonviolence. And if you read through every single one of those, those principles of nonviolence, so they had some form or feeling of this, that nonviolence is aggressive towards problem and not persons. In fact, one of the principles actually says, defeat injustice, not people. You see, what Martin Luther King could do is he could see an injustice happening and something awakened in him, something arose in him that this is racism, this is wrong, this is going against the very nature of who God is and the people who God created in his image. But he was able to do something. I'm going to attack the system and the sin and not the person. So Martin Luther King Jr. could see people that looked like him, black people, being treated improperly and unfairly and unjustly. And somehow, some way, not hate a white person. You see, anger is something that is actually placed inside of us. It's in us. <laughs> but that's not it. Because it says, be angry and do not sin. So what Paul is telling us is, yeah, anger is actually placed inside of you, but it's also incredibly easy to sin out of and inside of your anger. So that's why he says, do not let the sun go down in your anger. We're continuing in verse 26. He's like, listen, you got to figure out a way. I mean, it's, that is what it says. Don't let it go a day. <laughs> Don't let it go a day. And give no opportunity to the devil. That word opportunity literally means location, place, or room. So it's basically saying, don't give the devil a guest room in your house. Uh, a couple weeks ago, my, my sister and my, uh, my nephew came and hung out with us, and they spent a couple days with us. And um, he's two. He's two, and, like, my son's, I feel like my son's big. This dude's a tank. He's awesome. Like, awesome. He's just a big two-year-old. I love him. Um, and so my sister, my, my brother-in-law couldn't come. He was working, and so they came and stayed with us a couple of days. And so we, we don't have a guest room in our house, so we moved Shaw, uh, my five-year-old, out of his room and gave him his room. And he, um, I can't remember, he crashed on the couch or in my daughter's rooms or something. I don't know. Um, but we all know that when we bring someone into our house, it changes things. Now, Sam, if you're watching this, I love you, okay? I'm not saying a negative about you, all right, before we get into this. But it just changes things. I mean, you bring, you bring someone in their two-year-old, it changes your schedule. It changes how you do things. You don't walk around in your underwear. I hope you don't when you got a guest at your house. If you do, that's just, well, let's talk after. Actually, no, let's not talk afterwards. Let's just say right now, if, if you bring a guest in your home and you're just walking around in your underwear afterwards, that, that can get a little weird. Um, and so, but, but you know that when you invite a guest into your home, it just changes things. Sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad, sometimes it's just neutral it's just a change. What Paul's saying here is, hey, be angry. Do not sin. Don't give the devil a foothold. Basically, hey, don't give the enemy. And I love how Dozy said it a couple weeks ago. You can call him the enemy, the devil. He's just whatever you want to call that loser. Don't give him a room in your house. Don't give him a guest room. That's what Paul's saying because when you give him a guest room, he begins to change things. Verse 28, let the, greet, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. We'll come back to that verse. Verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. So the context of what Paul is doing in all of Ephesians 4 is he's saying, take off the old, put on the new. Take off the old, put on the new. If you're lying, take that off and put on the new. Be honest. So that's this whole context of saying you can take off the old self and put on the new self. Now, you can't do it. Jesus does it in us and for us and through us, but you can take off the old and put on the new. So when he says, and let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. He's saying, take this off. You see, here's how anger gets sinful. It's when it's directed and released towards other people. And what, what Paul does, and I'm, it's so good, what Paul does is he tells us, okay, I've said, be angry, don't sin. 
Let me show you when sin or when anger gets sinful. Let all bitterness, so bitterness, if the anger settles in, it turns into bitterness. Bitterness is holding someone liable for something done to you. So this is what we do as human beings. When someone wrongs us, when someone hurts us, we basically become a debt collector. And we say that now you owe me. So we take a debt out on them and we say, until you can repay that to me, then we, have, we are at odds. I'm going to be a debt collector now. See, when someone hurts us and we choose not to forgive them and not to take off that bitterness, we choose not to handle anger in the right way, handle, I don't, handle anger in the right way, we become a debt collector. And we say, you owe me. You hurt me, you owe me. And, and, and for some of us, we're holding a debt on someone from 20 years ago. <laughs> and we're saying, until you can repay me, then every, nothing's going to go away. And we're always going to have this relationship. We're always going to be at odds. And the problem is that that, thing, that debt has, that you've been trying to collect for 20 years has just kept simmering and simmering and simmering. And even on their best day, that person can't repay you. I'll be honest, someone who wronged you yesterday can't repay you. You, what we do is we become debt collectors, and the problem is that we are lousy debt collectors because we were never meant or created to be debt collectors. That person can't repay you and give back what was taken from you. They can't. And we continue to think to do so. Bitterness ensues, and we say, you owe me. So you want justice. You continually want to see the person you are angry at brought down. None of us feel that way, right? None of us online feel that way. Like, no one's ever wronged you. Like, I hope, I hope that a limb falls off. You know, like, or like, I hope that, man, you lose all your money, or I hope your car breaks down, or like, we've never hoped those things or wished those things on anyone, right? I know I have. Anger says, and, and, and maybe this will help us to differentiate between anger and bitterness. Anger says, again, we said anger is something placed into us by God. Anger says this is evil. Bitterness says you are evil. Anger says sin did this. Bitterness said you did this. Are we getting the difference between the two? We become debt collectors. We were never meant to be debt collectors. Which is why you see the person that did that to you, and their life is thriving. Everything's going great for them right now, and you're just so angry, and you're in so much turmoil, and you're hurting so bad. Because you're like, they... I can't believe that things are going well for them right now because they still owe me. What Paul does is he continues to say, this is what other, other sinful anger looks like. Wrath and anger. Wrath and anger, it's interesting. These are internal conditions. So for some of us, when we are hurt, we do this. We clam up, right? Like we hold everything inside and we tear ourselves up on the inside just eats away at us and eats away at us. And we see the person and it eats away at us even more. Then he goes, and, and then clamor and slander. So this is now external. So some of us clam up and some of us blow up. <laughs> some of us go off on the person. And maybe you don't do it to their face. And let's just be honest, normally we don't do it to their face. We do it to the, everyone else around us. Can you believe what they did to me? I can't believe that their, their life is going well after what they did. They deserve so much worse. And we begin to, we begin to verbally and externally Admit that. <laughs> and so wrath and anger tear us up on the inside. But if we take clamor and slander or malice, we begin to tear up people. We begin to go after them. What we learn is this. And what Paul's trying to get us to understand is anger and do not sin. You see, what we focus on is what grows. So let me just show you what happens. So somebody hurts you. They betray you. They lie to you. They don't, they don't come through in the way you expected them to do, and it creates just a little giant. Anybody remember the movie Little Giants, by the way? That has nothing to do with anything, all right? But we got a little giant right here. Now, what's funny is to see this little giant, um, I mean, I could easily just flick him and get him off the screen, and we'd be fine. Like, there's nothing really intimidating on in that. And I would just be honest. Like, this is the way, this is why when Paul says, be angry and do not sin, don't let the sun set on your anger. Like, don't let a day go by. Paul's trying to get us to understand that when someone does something wrong with you, in fact, it's actually the small. But what happens is we, we get angry. And then we feel hurt. 
And now all of a sudden, the giant grows a little bit more. So now we're hurt by it. And I, and I just I want it to be said right now. I am not trying to discredit what was done to you. I'm not just, like, it's easy for us to say, hey, just get over it. Like, maybe, maybe that's why you hate church. Maybe that's why, you, you know, you don't want to have anything to do with church because someone said it before. It's not that big of a deal. Just get over it. I'm not saying that. So please understand. I'm not trying to discredit or disqualify what has been done to you. I'm just trying to get us to understand what happens to us. So, so, so we see someone did something wrong to us, and then we're hurt, and we feel that. And for a lot of us, we hold it in, and we don't know how to deal with the hurt that's been done to us. And so what happens is we become bitter and angry, and the giant just grows a little bit more. Because, again, what we focus on is what grows. So every time we see them, it just wells up inside of us. Every, every, time, every time they say something, every time they do something that hurt us, it just festers a little bit more because we've held on to it. We've held on to it. And so what someone did to you created this thing in you this anger. For most of us, it was probably an injustice. Probably should never have happened to us. Well, there was something that happened to you as a child, or whether something's happened to you as an adult, you were probably done wrong, and you were angry, but you didn't do anything with it. And so it continued to grow, and continued to grow, and that bitterness, that holding it in, that wanting justice, it turns into resentment. And before you know it, now the giant's nine foot six. And, and we talked about this last week with our fears, but when you feed the giant, the giant grows. So, so, so when you feed resentment, it continues to grow, it continues to grow, and it continues to fester, and it continues to make you more and more angry, and then you start taking it out on other people. Listen, the enemy knows how transference works. So you're taking out on your kids what was done to you. The enemy knows that if he can take one thing, you gave him a guest room in your home, and now it's just kind of changed the whole household. And so what was done to you 20 years ago, you're still taking out on your kids or your friends or your family or your coworkers, and it wasn't ever their fault. But the giant's gotten so big, you don't know what to do with it. And here's what we do. We do one of three things. And we're just going to leave it up there so you can just have a focus on it. We, we, we repress it. Or we suppress it. And so there was something that was done wrong to us, and there's something that's trying to come to the surface, but we just keep shoving it down and pushing it down and pushing it down. The problem is it eventually surfaces. See, there are a lot of people with resentment that don't even know that they have it because they shoved it down for so long. Here's a couple of things. If you are someone who suppresses it, could probably identify, maybe this is me. First thing is you become angry over the little things. Like the little things. Like this is just a very small story, but when we um, first moved into our house, we wanted to um, put a playground up on some, some land, and so someone was trying to be helpful, and they just planted grass seed where we wanted to put mulch. And so they, gra- they planted rye that grows fast. And so all of a sudden, um, just out of them trying to be helpful, and then we got mulch and we put it over that. So guess what happens? We're supposed to have this incredibly just beautiful mulch playground, and now all of a sudden grass sprouting up everywhere and so I take weed killer and I just start spraying it and spraying it and spraying it and this happens for like three weeks and all of a sudden one day I'm just I get on my hands and knees like this is I look like a crazy person y'all but I get on my hands and knees I'm just ripping out grass I'm ripping out grass and I stand up and I grab the the weed killer I throw it against the playground I'm like ah why and Lauren walks out and she's like everything okay everything all right like, like the littlest things just can set us off, grass popping up out of nowhere. But you get angry over the little things. You suppress so much that you don't know what to do with it. The giant's there. And so the little things just set you off. Or you complain about everything. You can always find the negative. It's because there's a giant there. Maybe you don't even know it's there anymore. This has been eaten away at you to complain about everything. Or you're overly sensitive and defensive. So just let's just be 100 right now. Do we even use that anymore, 100? I don't know. Let's just be real. The things that I'm saying, you're so mad right now. You're so defensive. Like, that's not me. That's not me. That could be a sure sign that that is you. The other thing that we do, if we don't suppress it or repress it, we rehearse it. 
So we replay it in our mind over and over and over again. I'll just be honest, this is my favorite one because when we replay something over and over in our mind, um, we're always, we always come out looking amazing. Like we're always the right one when we replay something over and over in our mind. These are the ones that you, you, you drive in your car and you talk, you're talking to that person. You've had 30 conversations with that same person over and over and over again. And every time it resolves, that person feels like the littlest person in the world and you feel like the greatest person in the world, right? We rehearse it over and over and over again. And the giant gets bigger and bigger and bigger because we never actually do anything with it. But when I, get, when I park my car and get out of my car, I feel great until I see that person again and realize that the problem was never solved. Or the last one we do is we just release it. So we take it out on them. We say this, you did something to me and I'm going to make your life a living hell. And we release it. I just, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, tune it in or you're in the room. I'm so glad you're here. So glad you're here. And I will tell you this, you probably feel what I'm talking about. And science would tell us, science says that nothing eats away and takes away the years off of our life like unresolved anger. Science says that. Mayo Clinic, I could, I could pull up reports, Google it. Nothing takes away and eats away at our, the quality of our life like unresolved anger. But can I tell you what really is really happening? If you're a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit inside of you is grieved. Because your heart, my heart, is his home. And what you did when you allowed anger to fester and the giant to grow is you gave him a key to the house. You gave Satan the key. And anger is the opportunity that the devil has been looking for. The enemy has been looking for. It gives him a piece of your property to build on. And for some of us, he's been building for years. Some of us, it's been days. But he's building on it, and he's building on it, and he's building on it. And what's happening and why this doesn't sit well with you is the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and he's trying to build up fruit of the Spirit. Love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. I lost one. I left one out, but we're going to move on. And here's what he's doing. He's like Rocky in the gym saying, I'm trying to build you up. I'm trying to do something good in you. I'm trying to make you stronger. I'm trying to make that patience and that love and that self-control so much richer and so much greater so that it affects all those around you, but you've allowed the enemy in through anger. And what he's trying to do, I'm trying to build it up, he's trying to choke it out. He's trying to kill it. You see, that's why the turmoil is happening. Science says it eats away at your life, but... Internally, if you're a follower of Jesus, it literally is eating away at your soul. And you feel it, and you know it. So here's what I'll ask you to do. Would you identify the giant, but not that giant? Would you identify this giant? You see, the, the, the big giant has become this thing that you've created and that the enemy's done in you, but really, we got to go back to where you were hurt, where that little giant was started, where that little giant was born and created. Would you identify that right now? You don't have to say it out loud, but would you identify it? This person, this thing, whatever it was. I, and some of us, man, you got to do some work. Maybe you can't even. You're, just, you're angry and you're upset and you got a short fuse all the time and you don't know why. And this is going to take some time maybe. But for some of us, we can, we can point back and say, this is what it was. This is what it is. Would you identify the giant? Hold him close fist. Hold him, hold him as tight as you can right now. I'm giving you permission. Hold on to it right now. And let's read verse 32. So Paul just said, put all this off. Verse 32. Be kind to one another. I know you don't want to hear that. Tenderhearted. I know you don't want to hear that. Forgiving one another. I know you don't want to hear that. As, as God and Christ forgave you. With that giant in our hand, be kind to one another, <laughs> tenderhearted, mm, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. You see, if that, if that comma right here was a period, I just want to be honest with you, we'd all be in trouble. If, if, if that last phrase didn't exist, then we would all be in trouble. Because you and I don't possess the ability or the power to forgive someone fully. No, we don't. Again, we look at our giant and we say, I'm going to be David. You can't be David. You and I cannot be David. Because forgiveness doesn't start with us. 
It starts with God. It isn't impossible to be a forgiving person until you embrace that you are a forgiven person. You see, the power that you need to forgive other people only comes through receiving forgiveness yourself. Ephesians isn't going to be on the screen, but Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses, our sins, our anger, our bitterness, our malice, our wrath, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So this isn't, like forgiveness isn't something he just kind of threw out once. Lavishing something on someone, it says, hey, you can have the room and you can also have the house. I'm giving you it all. Like I'm going to lavishly uh, offer this and pour this all over you. The forgiveness that you need for your sins, I'm going to pour all over you. You see, I've been here before, and I've held on to things, and I've wanted people to suffer. And when God broke through to me, I realized that the debt that existed between me and the person that I created is the same debt that it was in between me and God. Because there was a debt that I could not pay that was dismissed through Jesus. And so the problem is that we want to continue to try to build ourselves up and say, okay, i got to forgive this person. I, I'm going to figure out a way to forgive this person. The problem is it doesn't start with us. Like that power that you need, it only comes from what you have received. So this is why you just can't get there. This is why maybe you've been struggling to get there. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I'd say this is why you just can't get there. If we are a follower of Jesus, for some of us, we've forgotten how good the forgiveness of God is to us. And we've forgotten that we and our debt that were taken out on God were worse than what was done to us. And he lavishly forgives us. Because the problem is the forgiveness that we receive is the only forgiveness that we know how to give. So if you've you've experienced and received half-hearted forgiveness that hasn't come from God, then that's all you're going to give to other people. But, But if we realize... That what God has given us and what he's offered to us, the forgiveness of sins through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross, once and for all paid, done, the debt canceled. If we understand and are reminded of this, then we begin to get a taste of what freedom could feel like. Because then we can step into forgiveness. And what forgiveness says is I release my right to retaliate. I may have every right in the world to retaliate. And justice was done to me, but I release my right to retaliate. I release my right to settle the score. Forgiveness is canceling the debt. I'll just be honest. We are much better debt cancelers than we are debt collectors. It is canceling a debt. One man said it like this. Forgiveness is learning how to set the prisoner free only to discover that the prisoner was me. You see, for too long, you've been fighting... (laughs) to see that person fail instead of fighting for your freedom. You've been fighting and just wanting to see something bad to happen to that person instead of receiving the freedom that God has offered to you. And your heart was not created to hold resentment. It wasn't created to fight the giant. And the greatest thing that can be born from your battle with resentment is freedom. The greatest thing, the greatest thing to be, that can be born from your battle for resentment is not that that person has like something bad that happens to them. It's not that they would fail. The greatest thing that can be born from your battle with resentment is freedom. So can I just tell you lovingly, don't tie your freedom to someone else's decision. Because the decision has already been made and it's through the blood of Jesus. You're forgiven. So experience freedom. Because the place where where anger is dissolved and the giant of resentment is defeated, is the cross. Because here's what happens when I look at the cross of Jesus. I am reminded of my failures. I'm reminded of my flaws. See, what anger is, anger is just a bow to make, make it look pretty. What anger does is anger allows you to focus on the person's flaws and not your own flaws. What resentment allows you to do, and the enemy loves it. The enemy is like, if I can, if I can get my, his mind off of or her mind off of what's wrong with them and focus on what's wrong with that person, I'm winning right now. But when we look at the cross of Jesus, we see what Jesus has done for us. We're confronted with our imperfections. And we understand that God isn't asking us to solve the problem of the person's sin. And he's not asking us to solve the problem of our sin because he's already solved that problem through 
Jesus. So this morning, would you not step into trying to fight the battle of resentment? Would you understand that Jesus has already done it for you? He's already given you that forgiveness. And all you have to do is extend it. And in that, you receive freedom from it. I was, this past week, I was, we were at a, um, we got to kind of take part in this leadership conference. And there was one lady on there. And what's about to go on the screen is not me. It's, it's all what she said in her story. But her husband cheated on her. And she found out. And she went through a year, years of resentment and anger. And she was going through counseling, which I would encourage if you're struggling with this. She said, at one point, the counselor said, here's what I want you to do. Here's here's note cards and here's a pen. I want you to write down everything that was done to you, everything that was taken away from you. And she began to write down everything that was taken away from her and put it on the floor. She kept writing it down. She kept writing it down. She felt, she said, I wrote it down. There's this long line. At the end of it, I stepped back and she said, I felt, I felt a little bit better and a little bit more free. And the counselor said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to that, those note cards and I want you to cross this out. And I want you to say that I forgive you for this. <laughs> she said, whoa, 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 that's a little too much. I don't feel like forgiving that person. And here's what the counselor encouraged her to do and here's what she said. She said this, it's often your feelings that are the last thing to sign off on forgiveness. It's often your feelings that are the last thing to sign off on forgiveness. It's the last thing, so so feelings actually come after the choice to forgive. So here's what he told her to do. This is what you say. I forgive for, and whatever my feelings will not allow for, the blood of Jesus will surely cover. I forgive them for this. And whatever my feelings will not allow for, the blood of Jesus will surely cover. Do you understand what's happening at that moment? Saying stop looking at the person and look at the cross and trust that even though you may not feel it right now, that the forgiveness that was extended to us is a forgiveness that can be extended to others and the freedom that can be received by all. See, a forgiving first person believes the calling ahead of me is greater than the past behind me. The new ground is greater than the now ground. And so whatever I got to do to push through that giant and turn that barrier into a bridge to freedom, I'm going to do. And so let me just offer you or you online what that is. It's accepting and experiencing the forgiveness of Jesus. It's believing that this Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and when he did that, you were freely and fully forgiven if you believe and if you receive. And this morning, I think God's wanting us to be free, but I think he's wanting us to accept that freedom. So here's what we want to do. We're just going to give you a moment. We want to sing a song over you. It's a new song we're going to sing this morning, but we want to sing some of the words over you this morning. It's this idea that, you, you, God, you take what the enemy wanted to use to destroy me, the giant that the enemy wanted to destroy me, the giant of resentment, and you use it for good. God, I'm using the barrier that, 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 that the enemy put in front of me. I'm using that barrier to be a bridge to freedom, and I'm doing it through you. I'm doing it through the cross this morning. So we're going to drop the lights a little bit, and we're just going to give you some time. You can bow your head and close your eyes and just spend some time with Jesus. For some of us, it's believing that Jesus died on the cross for my sins for the first time ever, and I'm actually freely and fully forgiven. It's, some of us, it's blowing our minds right now because you can't imagine that he can take the long list of things that I've done wrong, and he can forgive those and wipe them clean and set me free. Yes, he can. It's the good news of the gospel. For some of us, it's, it's believing that for the first time, and others of us, Man, it's just being reminded of how good this God that we gave our life to really is. And asking him, God, would you give me that power that comes through you because you're David, I'm not, to forgive this person. We've been holding on for too long. We experience freedom today. So just at your own time with God, you can have that. We want to sing this over you.